you know, technology might be great, but sure takes an ordeal to get through it. <laughs> but it's an advantage because the message is going beyond these four walls. And there are people, and we, we keep track of the records, and so we know that uh, people are going to be listening, and they make comments every now and then. So, um, I mean, it, it's good to get the message out there. And the problem is, in our world today, is there's so many, many people giving false messages out there that the truth needs to be put out there. And so we're going to look at this lesson here. And it's one that I think we all need to focus on because there's not enough people who are seeking. Or if there are people who are seeking, that's all they're doing. They're just seeking. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're just seeking and continue to seek. And so, I mean, if we want to go to heaven, let's face it, we better be seeking the Lord. And I'm saying seeking with the intent and the purpose of doing what God wants us to do. I mean, so that, that's what we're supposed to be doing. See, to please means to make one satisfied. And we're talking about pleasing God. And, and so joy and happiness are found in the one who is pleased. So if one is pleased, I mean, if, if your kid does something that you're pleased with, you're happy, you're proud of them, and you, you don't mind telling people about it. We're always pleased about our grandchildren. We're always pulling out pictures and showing people our pictures of our grandchildren and how we're very proud of them, and somehow they get the idea you're proud of your children. But think about this. If we're pleasing God, he's going to be proud of us also. And so we need to work on making him happy. And so it is a way to gain approval from that individual. That's when we have to put forth our effort to please God. And so we're going to learn how to please God. See, the Bible reminds us over and over that our duty on this earth is to please God. That's the reason we were put on this planet was to please God. I mean, our duty is to glorify God and, and cause him glory. And so when we please God, he is glorified. And so we're accomplishing what God wants us to do. So we must take caution that we do not do things to please ourselves, which basically everybody in this world does. Everybody does these things to please themselves, and they seldom look to see, well, what pleases someone else? Now, the only reason we would try and please someone else is because we might get an advantage out of it. We want to please the boss, so we'll keep our job. We want to please the boss, maybe they'll give us a raise or something like that. Uh, we want to please our friends, so they'll hang on, they'll stay hang around us and stay around us instead of running away. And so there's so many things we do, but for the most part, all we think about is ourselves. What do I want? What's in it for me? Or something like that. And so we have to pay attention to that. Now, we God does allow us sort different types of pleasures. I mean, he, he allows us to have happiness. And yet we also know there are rules, laws, and restrictions on who, how to do those things. Yes, we can do these things, but God put, a, put everything in its place and he put, uh, like I said, the rules and the laws and the restrictions to make sure we're doing it right. And a lot of people, they just ignore that. They think, well, God's going to let me have fun. I'm going to go out and have all the fun I can have. I'm going to go out and party. I'm going to go out and get drunk. I'm going to go out and cavort and have all sorts of relationships and blah, 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 blah. And that's all they do. And that's what most people are just thinking about themselves. They don't consider others. I mean, as long as they're thinking about themselves, as long as they're getting what they want to do, I mean, they're okay with life, but they have little or no consideration for anybody else. They don't, they don't care if it hurts somebody else. We see this with the criminals. I mean, they, they decide, well, hey, I want to take that car. They don't realize the hardship. They don't really care about the hardship it causes others if, if they take your car. If they come up and take your wallet, they really don't care about you. I mean, this is what they want to do. And so we also must decide on whether we're going to please men or God. 
Now, that, that comes down on each and every one of us. I mean, nobody can do it for you. We all have to make those decisions ourselves. Am I going to live a life that pleases God, or am I going to continue to do whatever pleases me, or maybe the people around me? And that's what he's talking about. And so it is our choice. Okay, something just popped in here. I don't know why. Okay, let's try this again. All right. In the Bible, the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 1.10, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. I mean, that, this is a very powerful passage here that tells it, yes, we have a choice to make. And, you know, in Acts chapter 5, when Peter told the council that we must obey God rather than men. See, when we obey men, we're given in to what they want. And if they tell us to be silent, don't talk about Christ, don't talk about God, don't talk about morals or anything like that, I mean, we shut up and we're pleasing them. But we continue talking about these things and they're not going to be happy. But what does God want us to do? See, that's what most people fail to realize. What does God want me to do? And for most people, it's always been me, 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 whatever I want. And they've never really asked the question, what does God want from me? And so this is where one of the biggest problems we face is rooted. It's that selfishness. And we know in the religious world, there's thousands of denominations out there teaching all sorts of doctrines and going by all sorts of designations. And you wonder, does that please God? The answer is a flat out no. That does not please God. God wants us to be united in our doctrine, in our practice, in our faith. And yet all these denominations out there come up with all sorts of things. Now, why are they there? Because they don't want to do what God told them to do. They want to do it their own way. And so the main reason they all exist is because they would rather please men than God. And those men would be themselves or, or whatever makes them happy. I mean, so, I mean, the scriptures talk about that and we'll, we'll do it. But for most people, I just want to please myself. And, and that, that, that's the bottom line to every problem. And that is the root of every sin. Every sin has the root, I just want to please myself. Even if you commit a sin without thinking about it, not even realizing you're sinning, you're still doing what you want to do. And so you're trying to please yourself. As long as you're pleased with yourself, you think, well, everything must be okay. Well, a lot of people feel that way. But the solution is very simple. The solution to this problem is basically open your Bible and follow its teachings. I mean, that, 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 that's where, where it comes down to. People who don't want to follow the Bible's teachings, they're going to be doing their own thing anyway. They may want to try and justify and feel good about themselves, but uh, that's not going to accomplish anything. I mean, so, yeah, people can feel that way. And it sounds so simple, doesn't it? It is so simple. I mean, it's that open the Bible and follow its teachings. I mean, how hard can that really be? Well, if your mind is not set on worldly things, it's going to be extremely difficult. But if you're trying to please God, learning what God wants you to do is going to be a joy to learn. And so the problem is that people are not satisfied with doing what pleases God. Like I said, they want to please themselves. See, in Hebrews 11.6, it tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And, and so the person who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And so, yes, we need that faith in order to please God. We can't do anything of our own that will be pleasing to God. You might, well, well, I'll be a nice person or I'll do this or that. But, I mean, there, there might be some validation to some of the good that people do, 
But if they're not following God the way God wants to be served, I mean, it's not accomplishing anything for them. So we learn from Hebrews 11. We call that the, the hall of fame of faith. I mean, what pleases God is people doing what he wants them to do. Yeah, I mean, all the heroes of faith were recognized for what they did, not who they were. Most people in this world, they want to be recognized for who am I? And they, they do that, but God recognizes those who do something and specifically doing what God told them to do. In other words, keeping his commandments. That's what it comes down to. People don't want to keep his commandments, then they cannot claim a relationship with God, although many of them falsely do. And, and so if we're not careful, we might consider that God should treat us kindly for who we are and not what we do. Sometimes that, that might be a problem in the church even. Well, we're members of the church, so God needs to be treating us fine, kindly. Well, I mean, they had the same problem back in the Old Testament days. The Jews were, at one time, they were considered and told they were God's chosen people. But they got off and, and de departed from God, and they were practicing idolatry, bowing down to the false gods, practicing all forms of sexual perversion and all sorts of lying and all sorts of sin. And yet, but, but we're the children of God. I mean, he shouldn't, he, he shouldn't punish us because we're his children. And a lot of them seem to act that way. And God wants them to turn around and serve him. But God's not going to bless them that way. You know, yesterday I was on Facebook and I, I saw this little meme posted up there. Charlie Brown and Snoopy were sitting on the end, end of the pier and they, they were talking. And of course, the, the quotation was from, uh, Second Chronicles 7, 14. And one of them asked, do you suppose uh, people are waiting on God to heal their land? And then the other one pipes up and says, perhaps God is waiting for the, the people to turn from their wicked ways and serve him. And so, yeah, I mean, some people, they read what they want to read, that, oh, God's going to heal our land. we got to call on God to heal our land. But God put, put conditions on that. If my people who are called by my name will repent and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. See, people want God to heal the land, and they're not willing to give up their sin. That's the problem mankind has faced all the way back from the beginning. It's always been that way. There's nothing new under the sun. So we also remember the Bible story of the baptism of Jesus, that when he was baptized, the spirit descended upon, from above and lit upon him in the voice from heaven, which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, we, we think about that, and this might, uh, might cause you a little concern, but was God pleased with Jesus as a father's pride? I really don't think so. I mean, sure, your son does something great, you're proud of him. I mean, we all feel that way. If our child does something good, uh, something fantastic, yes, we're, we're very proud of them. But yet, God was looking at it from a different perspective. See, no, he wasn't. I mean, God was pleased that Jesus chose on his own to come to this earth to be mankind's savior. And that's what Jesus did. He made the choice. We read that in Philippians chapter 2, verses uh, 5 through 11. And this is what Jesus did. He emptied himself. He was in heaven with God. He was there, but he says, you know what? Mankind needs a Savior. I will gladly go. And that's what Jesus did to provide that salvation for mankind. And we can't have it in any other way. So trying to please God involves much more than just worship. Some people get this idea, well, as long as I go to church on Sunday morning, I will have worshiped God, and that's sufficient. But even like we were talking in class, I mean, how we behave in church, we've got to carry that outside these doors. We've got to live that way all the time. We can't just be pious on Sunday morning and then the rest of the the week, uh, the rest of the 167 hours, living like the world. I mean, that's a falsehood, and what it is, that makes us all liars if we're trying to do that. It makes us hypocrites. 
Not hypocrites, liars, deceivers. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, which word you use? That's what it makes people. And so worship is important. We realize that. And it's important to worship God, but do it the way he has revealed to us in the scriptures. Like I said, we have these thousands of denominations out there all doing all sorts of different things, different programs, trying to different methods to get people to join up with them. And yet very few of them actually use the truth to, to, as a drawing power. And, and so, I mean, they're, they're going to use gimmicks. They're going to use programs. They're going to give it away food. They're going to give away gifts. They're going to hold a lottery or something like that, just trying to get people to come to their services. And yet, the few groups that actually do preach the Bible, they seem relatively small. And why is that? Because people want to have it their way. They want what pleases them. And the people have learned that. People in the denominations know we got to give them what they want to hear, otherwise they won't come back. And so that's why we have to rely upon God's word. And yes, we're a lot smaller now because we won't give up God's word. I mean, so others are that way. And we're to worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's how we're supposed to worship God. When we come here, we're coming into the presence of God. And we're here for several reasons. Number one, to give glory to God, but also to encourage each other and to build each other up in the faith. I mean, without a church family, you're out there struggling on your own. You're out there in the waters and nobody is even willing to throw you a life raft or, or, or a life buoy or anything like that. And you wonder what's happening. I have no friends. I ha have nobody to turn to. But see, as a congregation, we're here for each other. We're to build each other up and set. And yet our worship needs to be according to the way God has told us to do. We have the example of how they did it in the first century with the church, as we read there in the book of Acts. And then the letters that the, the writers wrote to the people, tell them this is how you need to behave. Sometimes tell them how to behave in church tell them how to behave in life. And so that's what they always did. So we also please God when we become the type of people he wants us to be. That's right. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 5, that's what it says. We're to, both, we're to have the attitude of Christ in our lives. What was Christ's attitude? You go back and read the Gospels. Jesus said, my meat is to do the Father's will. I'm not doing anything unless the Father tells me to do it. That's the attitude we need to adopt into our own lives. We shouldn't be doing anything unless God has told us to do it. And that's how we should live. <clears throat> See, in Hebrews 13, 16, it says, and do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. You know, some people get the idea, well, if I go to church on Sunday morning, God's going to be pleased. I'll be okay until next Sunday morning. Some people have that attitude. But you know what? We're not supposed to neglect doing good and sharing with others as we can, or as some of us might say, blessing others. I mean, that, that's, that's what we do. We cannot neglect being a Christian that 167 hours we're not here. I mean, so, I mean, it's got to be a lifestyle, a lifetime effort on our part. So remember the judgment scene in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Uh, this is the scene where Jesus said, okay, there, there's a great throne room that we're all going to stand before God. And God's going to weed out the people, separate them right from the left. The ones who are righteous and living faithful, they're going to be on the right. Those who are wicked and who have not obeyed the gospel and have not obeyed God, they're going to be on the left. Now, he calls the ones on the left the goats. The ones on the right, he calls his sheep. Remember, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them for they follow me. Well, in this story here in Matthew 25, 
Jesus stands up because he's going to be our judge in that day. And he's going to point to these people on the left. You saw me hungry and did not feed me. You saw me naked and did not clothe me. You saw me in need of shelter and you did not provide that for me. Now, that their first response is, oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Jesus, when did we ever see you in that situation? Wouldn't we have helped you if you were in that situation? And Jesus explained, because you didn't, to, didn't do it to the least of mine, you didn't do it to me. And then he spoke to those on the right. His sheep says, you saw me hungry and gave me food. You saw me thirsty and gave me drink. You provided for my needs. And then they come back with, well, wait a minute, Jesus, I don't, I mean, you were already dead. I mean, I mean, here it is, 2,000 years after you've died, and uh, you're, exp you're saying that I did this? How is it? Because you did it for your brethren. You did it for your saints. You did it for others. And, and so how we treat others is going to be a major factor in, uh, in our judgment that we're going to face. And like I said, most people, if they're so focused on themselves, they don't care about others. They're not trying to help others. The only time someone's going to help someone else is if they get an advantage out of it. I mean, we, we see that. We, we talk about that all the time. Only if they can get an advantage. Like I said, what's in it for me? And so we also read that when children are obedient to their parents, God is well pleased. I mean, this is the way God designed it. Parents are supposed to teach their children and be good to them, but children should be obedient to the parents. Parents are supposed to be guiding them. And God is pleased in that situation. And we learn that servants who serve their masters well are good examples to others. And God is pleased. We read that in Ephesians 6, verses 5 and 6. And we can turn this from servants or slaves into employees. When employees serve their bosses well, I mean, they set an example for others. I don't know, in the workplace, I don't know how many times a good worker would be told all the time, slow down, you're making us look bad. I mean, they're, they're always getting grief from their fellow workers. You're making us look bad. And so when us bosses look out there, we see who's doing the work and is doing a good job. Guess who we're going to give the accolades to? Guess who we're going to give the praise to? The ones who are doing the work. The lazy bums, no, we're going to be on their case more because they don't deserve any accolades or anything like that. So these are many things which please God, and we have to learn that. But really, in simplest terms, doing what God has commanded us to do pleases God. I mean, all the time, without exception. Now, does that mean if I just do one thing he tells me to do, that's going to be good enough? No. I mean, he gave us a lot of things to do. And that's our responsibility to learn what those things are and then do them. We, it is a growing process that we go through. We start off with very, the basics, the, the very, very first steps. It's like the baby steps. We start off, we, we grow just very slowly, but then as we develop, we mature. And we can get stronger. I mean, the Hebrew writer talks about the time that uh, uh, those who, who are not accustomed to the word just are basically they have to be taught the meat. I mean, I mean, taught the, the milk of the word. But he says, receive the milk whereby you may grow. Over Peter said that in First Peter 2 and verse 2. And so we need to learn what those things are that please God. And honestly, it takes a lifetime to learn everything. We've got to be working on that. And we know that Jesus already knew what God wanted, and Jesus didn't fail God. So if we need to try and be like Jesus. We need to learn what does God want for me and then do those things. And so every one of those things that please God are authorized and commanded in the Bible. Trying to do something that's not in the Bible is not pleasing to God. And some people have this attitude. A lot of people, well, we're going to do it anyway. We're, we're going to do it. We're doing it in the name of the Lord. I mean, 
Let, let's look back several hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. They were killing people in the name of the Lord. That wasn't right. It was wrong. They were taking people's property and enslaving people, saying, well, we're doing this in the name of the Lord, so that, that kind of puts a, a, a validation upon it. No. If God hasn't commanded it, then it is wrong to do or trying to pre pass off as something that is right to do. A and so if it is not in the Bible, it is not pleasing to God. Really, Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. Or we can say, do all by his authority. Jesus has that authority. He was given that authority before he left this earth. He says, God has given me all authority in heaven and on earth. And so, and we're told in Ephesians 1, he has authority over the church. And so, if we do it in his name, it better be something that he has said. You know, just like 1 Peter 4.11, whoever speaks, let him speak as it were the oracles of God. In other words, if, if God said it, we can repeat it. If God didn't say it, we need to keep our mouth shut. We, we can't throw in human opinion or we, we can't turn to trying to appeal to emotions to get people to respond. Speak the truth. That's what we need to do. See, the Bible is complete and gives us everything we need concerning salvation. You don't need to go anywhere else. You don't need to go get a whole bunch of self-help books or books written by men. I mean, the Bible gives us everything we know, how to be saved, how to live a life that's right before God, everything we need pertaining to our life and eternal life and the way that we live. It's all there in the Bible. Trying to do anything without the guidance of God and the Bible is foolishness. The preacher said that. It's, it's all vanity. That, that's what uh, basically the book of Ecclesiastes is all about. Life without God is vanity. Trying to do anything without God and the direction he gives us is vanity. See, of course, we are also warned that if we do not do those things that please God, he will punish us accordingly. Throughout the scriptures, I mean, Old Testament and New Testament, God is going to be judging us. And he's going to be judging us based on what we do in this life how we live our life, and probably more important, how we end up our life. Some people start off in, in a pretty good place, but then they, they kind of lose focus and they turn away from God. I mean, this is what many of the Jews did back in the Old Testament. They started out faithful to God, but then they got busy and they got involved in all sorts of things, and then that they didn't want to do anything, have anything to do with God at all. You know, it happened to some people in the New Testament days. I mean, that, that does it. But it happens to people we know. I mean, there's people, we might be going to church with them for 10, 20 years, and all of a sudden, eh, I don't need this anymore. I mean, they just give up on God. And, and that's a real shame. So he will punish us if we do that. See, if we seek to please ourselves, we lack humility before God and are most likely involved in sin, which can keep us out of heaven. So keep that in mind. If we're just seeking to please ourselves, it demonstrates a lack of humility and a respect for God. And so learn to please God. I mean, how are we going to do that? Like I said, open up his book and read his instructions. Life's instruction book. What, what do they say? Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth. I mean, that that's it. So consider these thoughts. We're just trying to be right with God. That's what we want to do. And all of our listeners out there on the Internet, I mean, we're trying to do those things that God wants us to do, and we follow the Bible to do those things. And we know that if we're following the Bible, we can't go wrong. I mean, we shouldn't be going wrong. Yes, some people might stray, even though they're trying, and some people might be sincere and they have the wrong understanding of what the Bible's teaching. But we're trying to do our very best, and that's why we have each other to help us get to that point where we are right in the sight of God. So we always offer an invitation. I mean, it's very simple to become a child of God. All you have to do is hearing the gospel message, 
that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he died on the cross for my sins, your sins. I mean, he, he did it for everybody, but until we make it personal, it's really not going to have an impact on us. Christ died for my sins. And so what do I need to do now? I recognize that. Well, I need to change my ways. And that's what we call repentance. Repentance involves, yes, there's a godly sorrow. I have disappointed God. I'm very sorry I've done that. But it also involves a change of direction, a change in the way that I'm going to live. And then, of course, the willingness to confess that, yes, I believe Jesus is that Christ, the Son of God, and do that not only today or tomorrow, but every day the rest of your life. You've got to let the rest of the world know, I am going to follow Christ, who is my Lord. He's my master. He's my king. And that's the one I'm going to serve. And then to complete the process to get us to become a Christian, we have to be baptized for the remission of our sins. It's baptism is washed away, or baptism washes away our sins. As long as we have sin, we cannot be in a relationship with God. And I'm talking any sin. Even after we become Christians, if we sin, that damages our relationship. And if we want to be right with God, we've got to constantly be asking him for forgiveness. And yes, we should be asking him for guidance and for strength and the courage that we need. And we need to be given that not only to ourselves, but to each other. So if you're subject to the gospel invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing. Fearless souls, why will you sing?